So with me is Mick Cooper, a counselor, psychotherapist, researcher, and professor of counseling psychology at the University of, how do you say it, Roehampton? Roehampton, yeah. Yeah, Roehampton. So Dr. Cooper is one of the leading researchers in many psychological fields, the study of the importance of the therapeutic relationship in psychotherapy, existential and humanistic approaches to psychotherapy, and maybe more recently, pluralistic therapy. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, thank you for having me, sir. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. It's great to talk to you. Thank you. So, uh, your name among my uh, close friends and my colleagues is most associated with your 2003 book, Existential Therapies, where you describe the evolution of different kinds of existential therapy modalities, you know, logotherapy of Victor Frankl and the British and American movement. And before we get into your interest of existential therapy, I'd be really interested to know a little bit more about your personal development. Uh, I'd like to ask you, how did your decision to become a therapist come about, if it was an early or a gradual experience? Well, I think um, I was doing a PhD in psychology. It was fairly gradual, actually. Uh, I was in therapy myself when I was younger, and uh, I was doing a PhD in psychology. didn't really know what I wanted to do. But I thought I should do something useful as well as a PhD. So uh, I uh, started training as a counsellor mm -hmm. and found that I really enjoyed the work. Uh, and I think it was I think it was a depth of connection. Mm -hmm. uh, there was something about the, the power and the depth of connection that I experienced in that therapeutic work that just, um, there was a richness and an experience there that, mm -hmm. you know, I guess I didn't really experience anywhere else in my life and felt something very important. And I guess, although I loved psychology, um, compared with the understandings that you get through psychotherapeutic work. Uh, and again, the richness, uh, the, 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 the depth of exploration, mm -hmm. something that became more and more, you know, I wanted to understand people mm -hmm. and work with people and also do something practical, not just kind of theoretical mm -hmm. uh, uh, to engage with people. So, but in terms of where I got to existential, I mean, my background was, was kind of... It was client center, right? I read somewhere. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean... I was quite, I was quite political as a young man, okay. uh, as a kid, right from a, you know kind of left wing progressive, mm -hmm. um, and so issues around kind of equality, around um, kind of ethics values, were always really important to me, mm -hmm. and about kind of engaging with people in ways that were empowering, mm -hmm. um, and valuing of them and respectful and kind of non hierarchical. So I guess I was always kind of drawn more towards the humanistic approaches, mm -hmm. which I saw as kind of an expression of those values in, in the person-centered approach, for instance, about working with clients in a way that really starts from the client and values the client's strength and uh, understanding. And, and I, I never particularly liked the approaches where the therapist was the expert and the mm -hmm. one we do and the more kind of psychoeducational approaches. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was kind of drawn towards the person-centered approach. Mm -hmm and the relational side of it. And then I think for me, the existential approach was something that was pretty similar. That it starts from the standpoint that the client is a kind of thoughtful, intelligent uh, person who's kind of struggling with life. There's a definition of existential therapy that uh, it's basically two vulnerable human beings in a room together mm -hmm. talking about mm -hmm. and problems. And I think for me, that, that kind of concept of therapy you know, that I might know more about certain areas and I might have certain understandings, but essentially that the client and I are two people struggling and, and trying to understand the same question. In a way, we're all in the same boat. Yeah, so, we're all in the same boat. Yeah. I'm not, I haven't got my life sorted or I have <laughs> some kind of brilliant wisdom that uh -huh. I um, you know, impart to the client. Um, so I guess for me that the, the existential and humanist approaches have a humility that I'm sure is there in other approaches. Mm -hmm. uh, and some people come to the psychodynamic or even CBT for similar reasons. For me, it was an articulation of those values. And do you remember at that time you read some uh, specific text or author that really made an impact when you were younger? Rogers. 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 Yeah, it was reading Rogers' 1961 on becoming a person. Mm -hmm. And I think there was something there at a personal level about this notion of being true to ourselves and being genuine that I was just blown away it from. Clicked. I read it undergraduate. Yeah, it just, yeah, <laughs> it just, exactly. It really was. It was it was just amazing. Mm -hmm. And I just thought this man is saying what I feel. <laughs> what I've already I feel that when I read Rogers. I think it is. 
it was just amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and talking about Rogers, you started out as client centered. And how did you feel that approach? And what did you think of restricting at the time? Well, I started. I did like a year's training after my uh, undergraduate training. It's slightly different in the UK. We do undergraduate, and then you can do training as a, a professional uh, mm -hmm. therapist. Mm -hmm. So I did a year's person centered, and I like. I mean, I liked it, and I liked the kind of democracy. Of it. I found it quite frustrating. I found it quite slow. <laughs> and in the sense that I started off, we were just in this training course. There was about 70 of us. Mm -hmm. And we were literally just in a room together. Nobody, we didn't even know who the facilitators were. We were just in this room. Wow. Sitting there going, okay. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? Yeah. What, what's going on? What do we do? <laughs> and I think by the end of the course, after, <clears throat> after a year, we'd managed to work out when we were going to have tea breaks. <laughs> and as we got, and we didn't really do any skill. I mean, it was an amazing experience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people who did this training still meet. They're the kind of survivors group <laughs> for people who did this training. Mm -hmm. It was amazing, but I just got kind of too frustrated and too slow. So I went on and trained four years in existential therapy. Yeah. But then I went back when I was actually teaching. I was teaching more around person centered. Mm -hmm. And I love. I mean, I love the values. I love the uh, openness of it. I love mm -hmm. the relational side, and I did work around relational depth and you know the kind of depth of contact. But I think I found that there was a very kind of strong purist mm -hmm. kind of drive in there about people yeah. who were saying you know it has to be like this. It has to be you know you you, you can't ask questions. Not very you know, flexible. You mean? Yeah, it kind of. Felt I don't think that's there in the theory, and I'm not sure that's there in Rogers. Yeah. But why the some of the people in the community interpreted it, and I never felt particularly drawn towards that. Yeah, what, you, what you're saying kind of reminds me of what Rogers called the uh, necessary and sufficient conditions for psychotherapy change. Yeah. Are you saying in a way that maybe like th those were clearly like important, but maybe not sufficient in a way? Well, I think, it, I mean, I would say it varies for different clients. Mm -hmm. And I think that my problem with it is that, um, you know, it's just a universalization. Mm. To say that for, <clears throat> for every client that these are the necessary and sufficient things. Yeah. People are different. We know from the research that some clients do better with empathy than others. Yeah. Uh, we know some clients probably need more technique and want something more directed. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it was a brilliant statement. And it was hypothesis. You know, Rogers was never saying, this is the only thing we're ever going to know about therapy. He was saying on the best of our knowledge so yeah. far. Yeah. But it, it kind of got turned <clears throat> into a bit of a mantra in some elements of the person sense world, you know, and, and, you know, people were still referring to it. I mean, the research has moved on massively. We understand different things now. So to, to, to kind of frame a therapeutic approach around what Carl Rogers said in 1959 uh, or 57, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't make much sense. It's more of a religion than a, than a way of... <laughs> yeah, of course. And that's always one of the problems that of different therapeutic orientations, right? Yeah, yeah there's some religions. And you once did actually like an international survey of key offers and text influencing practice of existential therapy. Yeah. And uh, out well, of... that was by Edgar Correa led on that, who's your... Ah, your... Portuguese, Edgar. yes, Edgar Correa. Uh -huh. And um, the first one that came out of that research was Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. Did that surprise you in any way? Yeah. <laughs> I think so in a way, actually, because in the UK... There's not that strong of a kind of logotherapeutic influence. In fact, in the UK, in the existential therapy field, people tend to be more based around people like Emmy Van Derzen and Esther mm -hmm. Spinelli. Yalom is kind of influential, but not that much. But there's, I think the meaning-centered therapies tend to be seen as more directive, more mm -hmm. psychoeducational, kind of not really grappling with a lot of the deeper existential questions. So I was quite surprised, in a way, mm -hmm. how influential Frankl was. But I think what's been interesting for me is I've been working with something called Joel Voss from uh, Holland, who's been very uh, uh, focused around the meaning-centered approaches. Mm -hmm. And I think what, what I've realized recently is actually there's a really strong body of evidence for a lot of these kind of Franklin-inspired approaches, working with people with cancer and serious disease, diseases. And that, you know, I can see that there's, there seems to be a lot of value in, yeah. in that way. I mean, again, Frank was amazing what he inspired. And there uh, seems to be still a very big community of logotherapy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's, there's the logotherapeutic community mm -hmm. and people like Alexander Bathani uh, mm -hmm. in Vienna. Yeah. yeah. 
and you know they're really vibrant. They're doing amazing research about the, uh, these these approaches. Mm -hmm. And then you've got Alfred Langle, who's kind of moved in, into a slightly more generic form of therapy, but still based on Frank. On that, yeah. And, and that's a massive community as well. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of people doing meaning-centered therapies at the moment, and mm -hmm. really exciting, uh, innovative work. And, uh, uh, and at Breitbart, we in Breitbart in the states. Uh, I'm really showing very, very good effect. I mean, we did a meta-analysis of the effects of the existential therapy, mm -hmm. uh, and we found that by far the best evidence was for the meaning-centered approaches. It's very interesting. It was yeah. much less convincing for the other forms. And in, in many cases, there just wasn't evidence, but uh, yeah. the meaning-centered therapies did really well. Yeah, and I, I heard you also elsewhere talk about how, uh, coming back to you in your personal development, that you did the person-centered, you were kind of interested in gestalt therapy also? And then that was also maybe because you felt that need for a little more structure or directiveness. What was it about it? I, I think it was quite exciting, really. <laughs> I think I liked it, you know, I liked the chair. I did some training with Robert Elliott mm -hmm. around emotion focused therapy. And, you know, I really enjoyed it. I think as a practitioner, I'm, I'm quite cautious. And I'm probably a bit too cautious. And when I talk to my clients, get feedback from my clients, mm -hmm. they often say they want a little bit more of a push. <laughs> and I sometimes wish that in my training I had done something maybe a bit more dynamic, a bit more... I, I think that energy comes often from the relational stuff, and that can be incredibly powerful. But I think there's other ways into it that I probably could have learned and you know, would have been really interesting to, mm -hmm. uh, to do. And I think more and more recently when I look at the research, you can see how helpful those approaches are. Yeah. But it, I guess it's always, it's, it's, it's always easy to, to kind of come back to the things you're more familiar with. Yeah, of, course. yeah of course. Right. And from where you're coming from, because you didn't actually then uh, study in Gestalt, you went straight into existential in a way. Yeah. And how was that? Uh, did you read something? Was there an open course at Regents, right? I, I wanted to do something humanistic. Yeah. Uh, kind of it's, it's humanistic. And yeah, I just got a place on it, really. I think one of the other things, though, was that I did do some like, Gestalt training. And although I like the methods, I, I found it a little bit. I mean, again, there was something about a kind of religious element, and there was something about people saying, you know, this is this is how people function. Mm -hmm. That kind of put me off a bit. That it was saying these are the truth. There was something a bit, I don't know, pushy, a bit bullying sometimes. Mm -hmm. I think I went to some workshops and personally felt like I didn't feel that cared for. Kind of, a, a kind of emotionally, I was kind of wrung through something and came out on the other side of it. Yeah. So I think it, it felt a little bit hard for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and yeah, I based on the next essential and um and I, I enjoyed the reading, I liked the teaching, it was you know, I could understand what I mean a lot of the practice in reality was very person centered, you know, and one of the things we're finding in our research on existential therapy is that a lot of the time it's very similar to kind of in reality it's very similar to person centered practice. Some of the research coming out of Portugal yeah. is showing that the existential therapists, what do they do? They they work relationally, they do a lot of phenomenological unpacking, yeah. uh, they explore clients' experiences. It's not a million miles away from person centered. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I like that kind of style of therapy. Mm -hmm. and, and clearly, like we're always talking about, also like this term of flexibility and sometimes rigidity that you found. <clears throat> I'd like to talk a little bit more about that in a minute, especially when we talk about pluralistic therapy yeah. you've been involved with. Uh, but before that, like I would just like to uh, say that I've noticed that you're a fan of quoting the Rogers uh, quote that the facts are always friendly. <laughs> and it seems to me that your interest in research has also helped shape your evolution as a psychotherapist. Yeah, and totally. I, I, I was curious uh, if there was any moment you remember that the research made you have to rethink deeply some aspect of your work as a therapist. Yeah, well, just on the first part, I mean, I think that's absolutely right. But I think going along to meetings, say, with the Society of Psychotherapy Research and working with people like John McLeod, um, and understanding more about the research made me, I think that really did impact on me. And, it, and I mean, I love research. And not because, again, not because it's a religion, not because it tells us the truth. Mm -hmm. But it's just a really creative way of challenging, you know, our assumptions and our biases and mm -hmm. the things that we might think about. I mean, I think, you know, some of the, I think one of the things that research has really done, if I think about what I really love from research, for instance, one of the first things is about the importance of being friendly with clients. I mean, that seems like a really important thing, but my training, although it was existential, it was quite psychodynamic. There was a lot about kind of boundaries and formality 
and you did things like, you know, when you finished the session, you stopped after 50 minutes, <laughs> the client was upset, you didn't kind of extend it, you just stopped. Yeah. And then, you know, you didn't talk to clients after that. And I think what the research shows is that for clients, it's often the things around the therapy relationship, being cared about, feeling like the therapist is really there for you, that are the really important things that help clients stick at therapy, feel that it's actually helping them. Yeah. So I think one of the things was realizing that actually I can be more relaxed. You know, if a client asks me about a holiday, you know, where am I going on holiday? I don't have to say, mm, it's interesting that you're asking me about <laughs> holiday. I wonder yeah. what that is for you. You know, that's just rude. And actually, it's probably more counter therapeutic than saying to a client, I'm going to France or I'm going to Portugal. Of course. And, and you seem to be always uh, also talking about the um, flexibility to ask for feedback, to, to yeah. be available. Yeah. Well, I think what's interesting in the research field is that I think we're moving from kind of nomothetic, using research nomothetically, mm -hmm. as in what works uh, generally for clients, mm -hmm. more and more to using it ideographically. And actually, because of computers and IT and the way that we can get immediate feedback on forms, and uh, uh, that we can now, with an individual client, say, okay, how's this therapy working for this client? Yeah. And how can we maybe tailor it and improve it? And the pluralistic approach that we've been working on is very much about using feedback mm -hmm. as a way of rethinking what we're doing with clients and, and, and improving the work and trying to make it as helpful as possible for that individual person. So tailoring it to the individual. Yeah, so let we, let's go into that. So you and Professor John McLeod, is that what it's, yeah, McLeod? Cloud, yeah. McLeod, <laughs> yeah, have, have worked on an approach to therapy called pluralistic. Yeah. And you also edited recently with Wendy Dryden the Handbook of Pluralistic Counseling and Psychotherapy. Uh, could you tell us just briefly what is meant by pluralistic therapy and why do you see it as a contribution to the already existing models? Yeah, well, pluralistic therapy is a framework and it comes out of the kind of values and the, the humanistic standpoint I'm talking about. And it's an attempt to create a, a framework for thinking about therapy where we can be as genuinely open as possible to what's going to be helpful for individual clients. Uh, where we're not stuck in particular schools or particular uh, kind of orientations and trying to prove that orientation is good, but where we can think about the different goals that clients want, the different methods, and really try and, and tailor our approach to the individual clients. Now, a lot of integrative therapies do that, and you know, one of the questions we often get asked is, isn't this just integrative therapy? I was going to ask and, you that. <laughs> yeah, okay. And in many ways it is, but, but you've also got integrative therapies that are in themselves specific models. Like you've got, you know, you could say DBT as an integrative therapy or cognitive analytic therapy as an integrative therapy. And they're great therapies. I mean, they're incredibly helpful, but they are specific models. And I think we wanted to take a step back from that and, and create a framework where we could always maintain that critical stance and always be reflective and open to the whole. So for us, I think integrative didn't quite mean that. It means different things and we wanted a new way of thinking about it. I think the other thing about the pluralistic approach is that it is very much about collaboration with clients uh, and trying to tailor, as you said before, the therapy to the individual client. And again, that's often there in integrative therapies. But integrative, by definition, doesn't mean you know, you're working in collaborative ways. You could integrate different approaches, but actually it's still be very much therapist directed. So we wanted a different term, I think, that emphasized those values, uh, that openness, that uh, collaborative attitude to the client, the use of feedback, uh, and, and, and something that was kind of open enough where we could ask lots of questions. Mm -hmm. So I think the thing about the pluralistic approach, I mean, you know, one of the questions we're looking at at the moment is around shared decision making. Mm -hmm. So how can therapists and clients work together to um, a, a best tailor the therapy for the individual client? I don't think we've got the answer to that. I, I mean, this is a whole new area for therapy. What I'm pleased about is that we're beginning to ask these kind of questions. But they're really complex. I mean, you know, clients don't always know what's most helpful for them. Uh, clients may say that they want one thing, but actually they may really need something else. On the other hand, we know that clients preferences do correlate with outcomes and the more that clients get the therapy that they prefer mm -hmm. uh, the better they tend to do and particularly the more that they stay into therapy Joshua Schwiss and colleagues have done the meta-analysis so there is something important about client preferences how do we talk about it you know how do you say to a client 
what would be helpful for you? And what if a client doesn't know? Uh, what if a client says, I don't know, you tell me, what should you do? Do you, you know, so there's all these questions that I, I'm hoping that in this pluralistic framework, we've kind of opened up and that we're setting up on a research program. So one of my uh, PhD students at the moment, Adam Gibson, he's doing a research project where after assessment sessions, he's doing an uh, interpersonal process recall with a client mm -hmm. to talk to them about how was the assessment, uh, what did they, how did they experience the shared decision making, what was helpful, what wasn't helpful, yeah. you know, really importantly, was it too much? Hmm. And, you know, trying to build up this picture of what this process is like and what can be helpful there. Yeah. So it's really exciting. I mean, I love this pluralistic stuff, but, but it's much less about saying, okay, here's a new way of doing therapy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's much more about trying to create a framework yeah. in which we really think openly and freely about what's going to help clients. Yeah, what I really enjoy about what you're saying is that the, inside the framework of it, it's kind of impossible to be rigid. Like, yeah. <laughs> the whole structure of it uh, like uh, impedes you of doing that. Which yeah, you got, it. You got cool. it. Exactly. I think that's the best definition I've heard of it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very happy. <laughs> and and uh, I am, I'm also aware that you did an inventory with Dr. John Norcross. Yeah. Yeah. I privileged to work with him, yeah. Yeah, could you tell me a little bit about it's how yeah. is it called the Cooper Norcross inventory? Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So uh, this inventory of preferences yeah. and it's something I've been working on for a number of years and before it was called the therapy personalization form, but it was more of a kind of checklist that it wasn't a proper measurement and Dr. Norcross John was incredibly helpful in, in this kind of psychometrics and the ideas. But really it was about thinking about how can we find out from clients about the kind of therapies that they want, uh, you know, what their preferences are, uh, you know, and obviously we can talk to them about it, but mm -hmm. would it be useful to have a measure that could provide them with um, some kind of different um, items that they could think about what mm -hmm. kinds of preferences? And also what kinds of preferences, what are the dimensions of preferences that clients have? We don't, you know, some people have kind of started to look at this, but we still don't really know what are the main kinds, kinds of preferences. Mm -hmm. So we did a big questionnaire, we got lots of responses, online survey, yeah. and did a factual analysis and you know tried to look at the dimensions. What was interesting, I mean the main dimensions that we came up with was that was around directivity. Mm -hmm. So some clients want a more directive approach, some clients want a less directive approach. And that's actually come out when other people have done something similar. Uh, that's a, the key dimension that comes out is about, you know, do you want something that's directive, structured, goal focused, and yeah. more mm -hmm. open, relaxed? unstructured and then there was something about do you want something that is more uh, warm and supportive and friendly or do you want something that's more kind of mm -hmm. a bit more formal a bit more challenging uh, more kind of distant mm -hmm. and then there was a dimension about do you want to look at your past uh, or do you not and then the fourth dimension was around do you want a therapy that's emotionally intensive do you want to do <laughs> kind of work on your emotions or mm -hmm. do you want something that's perhaps a bit more cognitive Mm -hmm. What's interesting about that, I think probably for me the most interesting thing was that when we looked at those main dimensions, particularly the directivity one and the supportive one, what we realized is that that really maps onto what's called the interpersonal circumplex, uh, developed by people like Leary, which looks at those interpersonal dimensions, yeah. which is, you know, one dimension is around control and then the other dimension is around kind of approachability, uh, kind of warmth. Mm -hmm. So it seems like clients' preferences are maybe representative of a more general interpersonal dimension that some of us, you know, want people to be more or less controlling, uh, or we like people to be more or less kind of warm. And I think using that information and developing that, and, and the, the measures out there is freely available to use, yeah. can be a way of helping us to tailor and think about at the start about you know, what clients want. And of course, you know, it's not that you give the form to a client, they fill it in and then you just do whatever they want. I, I was thinking about this because it seems like uh, you have always to access it continually because of course the person at different phases would probably yeah. need different stuff. And, and as you say, you know, clients' change preferences may change yeah. and what they want. But I mean, having said that, what I found using these preference measures is that actually clients are pretty consistent. So if clients say that they want direction and structure at the beginning. They usually then, want it throughout. Yeah, because you can use these forms not just at the beginning, but as the therapy progresses and yeah, tailor yeah. it and change it. And actually, yeah, clients tend to say, mm -hmm. look, you know, that is what I want. Yeah. They don't tend to kind of flip and flop about. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's, this is all within the context of the research showing that 
clients do you have some sense of what's going to work best for them, and particularly around dropout, that if you can tailor the therapy mm-hmm. to clients' kind of preferred interpersonal style, yeah. they're going to get, they're probably going to stick at it longer and get more out of it. I'd like to ask you about uh, taking what you're saying about therapist flexibility, uh, because one of the propositions, I guess, what you're saying also in pluralistic therapy is about the importance of asking for client feedback. And asking for client feedback uh, can be hard. <laughs> so I'd like to ask you in your experience what you found to be the biggest challenges for therapists to practice an effective feedback routine with their clients. That is a wonderful question. <laughs> <laughs> I need to think about. What are the biggest challenges? I think one of the biggest barriers, perhaps, is that therapists often assume they know what clients want. Yes. So I think often therapists don't ask because they think that they have an intuitive sense. And therefore, the research showing that, um, you know, that as therapists, we often don't really understand our clients as deeply as we want to. Uh, is very important in recognizing the importance of making that explicit. I think what the challenge is, I think there is a challenge, you know, that a lot of our clients want to just get on with it. Mm-hmm. And being pluralistic means being pluralistic about pluralism and acknowledging the fact that some clients do want feedback and do want to give us feedback, but also some clients don't. Some clients don't like those kinds of conversations about what do you want. And I've seen yeah, days. No, I was going to ask you about that actually. Like, uh, if the specific client you're working with, for instance, doesn't enjoy feedback. Yeah. How, yeah. How do well, you? Well, you have to. I think you have to tailor yourself to that and not impose a kind of pluralistic. <laughs> we, know, we know that from the literature and shared decision making. There's this wonderful body of literature and shared decision making uh-huh. that I think we should be drawing on much more readily. And what that shows is that sometimes in medicine, patients they really want to be involved and 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 be part of the decision. And some patients just want the doctors to decide. Yeah. And then, you know, again, as you said before, some people switch. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they want to be more involved and sometimes they want to be less involved. So shared decision-making is being sensitive to that. Mm-hmm. And I think in therapy as well, it is about having a sense from your client, maybe even asking them about that, mm-hmm. about how much do they want to be involved in the decisions. I mean, my experience, and, and I think what the research shows, is that clients generally want on average, is very much on average, on average do you want more involvement in decisions about care and decisions about how things go. Yeah. But it's definitely the case that you can overdo it and you can just drive clients, a lot of clients are crazy, <laughs> I'm sure. You're constantly asking. And it can also come across as very insecure. Yeah. So you're constantly saying to the client, what do you want to do? Should we do this? It, yeah. it, it can be inconsistent. It can or even it. mechanical in a way, maybe? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and just give the therapist just a sense that they're not very solid yeah and, and by the way i know you recently published a research on pluralistic therapy in depression yeah yeah and i would like to ask you uh if you what are you working on now uh are you also going to do more research in pluralistic therapy yeah i mean at the moment we uh we're particularly trying to understand and we're following on from what we've been discussing we're trying to understand more about the processes of shared decision making. So mm-hmm. looking at clients' experiences of it, uh, looking at the relationship between levels of shared decision making outcome, conversational analysis about the process of shared decision making, how does it happen, mm-hmm. what kind of form does it take. So really trying to understand much more about these this process, what I would call metatherapeutic communication. Yeah. Talk about the process of therapy. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is it? What are the different types? And then how can that how can that be best used? within the therapeutic process. So that's kind of research we're doing. We're also at the moment, we just got funding to do a big um, randomized controlled trial of mm-hmm. humanistic counseling in schools. Great. So again, we're going to be, we're working on that. Uh, we've got a research center at Roham's called Crest, mm-hmm. Center for Research in Social and Psychological Transformation. So we'll be running that from Crest and that's with a number of partners around uh, the UK. Also, what a, you know, also where we go with Crest and in my own personal work is about trying to form those links between uh, psychological change and social change. Mm-hmm. So look at social issues. Some of the work we're doing in Crest is beginning to work with transgender clients and looking at issues of gender fluidity uh, and how we can work from that from a kind of humanistic stand. So um, all the work that I'm doing and that we're doing at Roehampton is, is trying to be at that interface of psychological change but looking at it from a kind of social ethical values based position 
great. Pluralistic Works comes out of that, but there's other projects we're working on as well. That's great. Uh, maybe it's connected with that. I'm not sure. I, I was going to ask you if do you think there's any, if you feel if there's any topic in psychotherapy that is seriously under researched. Aside from shared decision making, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean that that's the one that I'm particularly interested in the moment is about that process of shared decision making. I think with a lot of the integrative therapies, I, I think really understanding how we bring together different approaches. I think this question about how we tailor therapies. Uh, effectively understanding how integrative therapies work, mm -hmm. uh, what's some feedback, understanding the process. Of it. I think a lot of the problem with our therapies at the moment is that we, we, we maybe understand the, the link between input and output, mm -hmm. and RCTs can do that, and they can be very helpful for that. But often what we don't understand is the processes of change. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of our work now is using logic models, which is where you kind of try and map out what actually is happening. Yeah. Uh, when we're going to do our RCT of the school counselling, I think the most interesting part of that in many ways would be to try and map out why we think humanistic counselling is actually going to help anybody. Mm -hmm. You know, Rogers <laughs> gave a theory 50 years ago, but, you know, why would it be of help? Yeah. And, you know, is it because somebody feels that they've got a lot of problems and then that causes stress and that if they then talk to somebody, does that mean that they feel that that problem is just less with them, they feel maybe less anxious? I think with the pluralistic assumption is that therapy is not one thing, that there's multiple change processes that can happen. Yeah. So it may be the young people in school counselling, that they talk about things, they feel less stressed because they know someone understands their problems. Yeah. But it may also be that they, by talking to somebody that they get some ideas about what they could do differently. Yeah. Uh, it may be that they feel less isolated. You know, And that these are all interlinked processes, mm -hmm. but they're distinct. And... In our research through this RCT, we'll be able to do quality interviews and we'll be able to test out these different pathways of change Yeah. Uh, and really try and understand more about what the counselling is doing mm -hmm. and therefore who it may be more helpful for. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's a really important area is, is trying to understand in, 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 in an in-depth sense what the kind of pathways of change are and what the possibilities are. But I think because often the research is very quantitative, it doesn't so easily map out the, the, the processes the, itself. Process of change. Yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to ask you just uh, to finish off a little, but I, I, <clears throat> still talking about research. Um, some research in the uh, research indicates the existence of what sometimes is called super shrinks. And uh, well, maybe just people that who don't know it. This is basically like people who have been found out to have massively better results than other therapists. And the, some research by Michael Lambert and Bruce Wampold and Scott Miller, people like that, uh, have actually like found that kind of consistently, but they haven't really found the process that leads to that. Like, for instance, years of experience does not seem to correlate with outcome. And I'd like to know your take on this whole super shrink issue. Yeah, it's very interesting and it's very complex. Yeah. But I think, as you say, the research shows that some people certainly do have better, much better outcomes at least in particular areas. And, and, and the interesting question is why and what is it that they're doing? I mean, I would guess from my reading of the research, I would guess that the most important thing is that they convey a sense of care mm -hmm. towards their clients. I think that comes out for me, in the, particularly the quality of research, is this concept of care, that the clients feel that this is somebody who really genuinely cares about them, that they matter to the therapist, not just as a patient, as a client, but as somebody who uh, that, 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 they, that, that, that is there for them as a real person in the world. Mm -hmm. And I think if clients can feel that, and that they feel this person is really there for them, it creates a really powerful kind of sense of containment, sense of hope. It can really inspire hope to feel that somebody really cares about you. Um, and then I think on top of that, if that's somebody who is quite... I kind of probably quite directive, I think, in some ways. I mean, I think the research shows that clients often value somebody who's maybe uh, kind of caring, but in an active way, offering suggestions, being quite in depth, maybe sometimes being quite challenging, not really sitting back. I think probably mm -hmm. the least effective therapists on the whole are the ones who really sit back and are yeah. very distant. But then you've got a therapist who's kind of in there, caring, dialogic, warm, probably fairly confident. Yeah. and kind of inspire hope in the client that can then carry with them. I would guess that might come out of the research as being the kind of, the, the kind of secret ingredient. 
I guess the reality is that some of us are like that and some of us aren't. I'm not, you know, I wouldn't describe myself as like that. And, you know, I know from my outcomes that they're fairly good, they're not brilliant. Uh, how you become that kind of person, I don't know. <laughs> well, uh, I would imagine that a lot of this, uh, we also always have that self-serving bias, so it's really hard also to assess that, I would imagine. Yeah, but that's the great thing about research is you can look at research yeah. and you can look at outcomes. You know, I was doing a study... Uh, where we were seeing clients in a clinic, and I was seeing some clients, and some of my students were seeing clients. You know, and not unexpectedly, my results weren't particularly better than my students' results. So, okay. you know, research can challenge some of those self-serving biases, mm -hmm. help us think about, you know, it's not because I'm me that I'm there for a wonderful therapist. <laughs> There's things that my clients do, my, my students do, and maybe have that confidence and that ability that as a person I don't particularly have, mm -hmm. that allow them to be very effective. And that's, that, that's you know, going back to our earlier conversation, that's where research is great. Yeah. Because it can really challenge self-serving biases, challenge our assumptions, and help us think about these things in more open, more pluralistic way. So, so it's hard to be a rigid therapist if you take the research seriously. That's brilliantly put, Alex. <laughs> Thank you very much. Just to finish off, uh, personally, I, I'm a big fan of R.D. Lang and Ernesto Spinelli's work especially a book I read by Ernesto, Tales of Unknowing. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, I start to really get seriously interested in existential therapy through that. And I would like to give you the challenge that uh, if someone doesn't really know a lot about existential therapy, which book or books would you recommend to start off? Well, I think that, for me, that would probably be the, the best starting point. Uh, I think that's a brilliant book. Uh, in I mean, the Ernesto, book. yeah. Tales of Unknowing, yeah. I mean, I, I, that was very inspirational for me as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that basic, it's a brilliant series of case studies. Yeah. Um, I, I think it illustrates much better. I mean, everyone yell, loves Yalom, <laughs> but I think in terms of illustrating that process of therapy and what existential therapy, and that concept of unknowing, that, you know, you know, for me, I mean, I, I had Ernesto Spinelli as one of my main teachers mm -hmm. and for me a lot I mean he doesn't he's not mad on pluralism we've argued about it but for me pluralism is really an expression of that stance that I learned from him about unknowing and about openness yeah so I think that's a brilliant book to start off with I think you know I you know okay self-serving bias I think my <laughs> book on existential therapies which I'm just updating for sure. in 2003 mm -hmm. you know that kind of maps out the field And I think that's a really good introduction. I think that uh, there's a new handbook, a world handbook of existential therapies coming out that will give a really kind of broad overview. Mm -hmm. And I think all these different approaches kind of, and Estos is more of a particular form of existential therapy. But I think now, you know, my book or the handbook, it's giving a kind of broader overview of all the different kinds, which, which is perhaps the best starting point. Yeah, I, I've always had this uh, curious personal question, which is, in your book, The Existential Therapies, you describe the American movement, the British one, and logotherapy, and then you have a chapter just for R.D. Lang. <laughs> and I was, it, well, personally, I enjoyed it a lot because I enjoy his work, but I was really curious, like, it, it kind of stands out when you look yeah. at the context of it. It's interesting. Yeah. Right? I think, I mean, when, when I talk about, or when people now talk about the different kinds of existential therapy, they normally talk about the four different types, the meaning center, the, the Dasein's analyst, the existential humanistic. Yeah. And now people actually talk about the existential phenomenological rather than the British school, partly thanks to Edgar making the point that it's not just in Britain that we're doing this. So, mm -hmm. you know, th those are the four main ones. You're right, Lang does stand out, but I think, I guess he was such a seminal influence. Mm. Uh, and and can't really be categorized anywhere else. But I do think he deserves a chapter on his own. Mm -hmm. um, and there are people in the States, people like Michael Thompson in the States, the Philadelphia Institute, which have all been very influenced by his work. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, he, he, he was an incredible writer and really brought the whole ethics and the value of existential therapy to life. Yeah. Dr. Cooper, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. It's